won't seem to let me do that. It says share and I hit share and it's not happening. You have to pick what you want to share. Is that working? Not yet. It doesn't show anything yet? Nope. Well. Is it something that we've all had access to on the board? It's a spreadsheet, yeah. Oh, okay. An Excel spreadsheet. Well, maybe can you walk so, us through it? Yeah, let me, I'll talk to you, talk through it. So one of the things that um, Cass was talking about was increasing the, or eliminating the senior dues. And we looked at that from a chapter standpoint to see if it would be possible for us to, as a chapter, to absorb the cost of that increase for 2021 for those members that are senior in the senior membership. Right now, the um, we have seven individual seniors and we have four family memberships as well. The difference in price between the senior individual and senior family is going to the um, standard is it, it'll double the price. The senior memberships right now are about half the price of the standard membership. So that would increase the senior individual dues from $14 to $28 and the senior family from $16.50 to $33. Of the $14 current dues, six of it, if cash gets to keep, and $8 goes to state. For the senior family, it's six fifty for IPCAS and ten dollars to state. And again, it's for the regular membership. It's it'll be double that. And taking a look, I really wish this could show up. <laughs> It'd be easier than just talking a bunch of numbers. The bottom line is, if IPCAS were to cover that increase for the senior members. It would be a total impact to IPCAS of $164 for 2021. So part of that would be that for the individual seniors, the, the fee is $14. The dues to the state are $16. So IPCAS would not have any dues, any portion of that dues, and in fact would take $2 out for the individual and 350 out of the, the current fund, um, 350 for the senior or for the family, sorry. And in addition to that, then it would be $136 of a loss of income over the year for a total of the 164. Right. So, and and as a formal measure, like this is this is something that the IPCAS board will vote on um, at this point. You know, we wanted to make sure that members had the chance to comment. Best way to comment is to send email um, to IndianPeaksArchaeology at gmail.com. Um, but, but overall, it, it sounds like that is absorbable, especially when you consider that, you know, IPCAS was able to make $450 from the conference last month. So that certainly covers handling that difference, at least for next calendar year. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share, Cheryl? Uh, no, that was it. The one thing, only thing I will say is that for uh, the pricing for both IFCAS and CAS, that the dues have not changed since about 2003 on the individual and the, the standard individual and the standard family. Right. So it, it's been a long time since the dues have increased. And the only change that there has been since then is when the senior memberships were introduced 
and I'm not sure exactly, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. And that was a decrease. So it's just been a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And Cass voted to table the increasing the dues vote. So the only members affected are seniors so far. Okay. Well, if y'all are members and have comments, please email them um, to us. Um, I think I'm going to keep going through the announcements so we can have Bonnie take it away. Thanks, Cheryl. Am I still sharing or not? I'm not in there. Nope, but I am. Okay, At least good. I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, technical difficulties right after a move. Good times. Okay, so um, this month we have Dr. Bonnie Clark um, presenting um, material from her new book. And then next month we'll have Ryan Baker. Um, so stay tuned to IndianTakesArchaeology.org for information on upcoming speakers, also social media, email, all that stuff. Um, and I wanted to remind everybody that um, September's presentation from Dr. Mark Mitchell. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. It got really quiet all of a sudden, and that's always scary on Google Meet. Um, but yeah, Dr. Mark Mitchell's presentation um, about Molander is up on our YouTube if, if folks want to watch it. Um, it was a fun one. Okay, so without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Clark. Um, Bonnie, have you spoken to IPCAS before? Uh, I, I think I have, but it's been a long time. I yeah. Think it was when I really started this project. So, okay. That's fair. And I think it was probably before like your, um, your DU students infiltrated Boulder. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> before then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so rather than using, um, I think Bonnie's bio that she graciously provided, I just wanted to talk about um bonnie how i know her um bonnie is a wonderful and inspiring historical and public archaeologist um she has been gracious enough in the time that i've known her um to to help mentor and teach all those around her and really bring um cultural heritage and tangible history to people in a very accessible way um, and I feel really lucky to have known her throughout my graduate education and, and since as a professional. Um, so Bonnie was also Christian's um, graduate advisor. So she's had a big influence on us, I know. She certainly has. Yeah, a great influence. <laughs> um, so all good. Uh, yeah. Without further ado, Bonnie, would you like to, to take over the screen? Sure. And start your presentation. And by the way, Bonnie's book that she'll be talking about tonight is available. Is it still pre-sale or is it it's sale still, sale? I thought it was. It, it's still pre-sale. So I, I have okay. a little a little blurb up there so you can, it, it even has the discount code. I'm going to let you all in on the secret. Perfect. And it is also on the IPCAST website. Oh, great. y'all are looking for it and I'll repost and email it with the, uh, the video link. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so can you all see my screen here? We can. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks so much for that really kind introduction, Katie. It was um, wonderful to be able to, work with both Katie and Christian um, when they were at DU. And I've continued that relationship. They've kindly um, worked with my students in some of my field methods courses. So it's been a, a really productive relationship. Um, and I thank you for inviting me to come talk about this work. Um, it's sort of, you can file this under, you know, shameless self-promotion in a sense, but uh, it's also, I. Um, just happy to be able to tell you about this really important Colorado site at a time that's um, also kind of critical in its um, history as a heritage site. Uh, so 
I could talk about this for a really long time. And in the interest of not rambling on and on, I actually have this all printed out. So uh, forgive me for reading. Um, it will keep me pretty close to time. Um, beauty, hope, community. These are hardly the words that people associate with sites of incarceration. And yet these are ideals that are reflected in the gardens built by Japanese Americans at all 10 of the internment camps in which they were held during World War II. The backstory to these gardens is one of the sad ironies of American history. The late 19th and earliest 20th century were characterized by both a fascination with Japanese design, especially as it was expressed in gardens, and a simultaneous mistrust of the Japanese people. Particularly in California, it became a status symbol for non-Asians to have Japanese style gardens or to employ a Japanese gardener. And yet many of these same residents likely supported restrictive legislation like the state's 1913 alien land law, which prevented um, Asian immigrants who were classified uh, at the federal level as aliens ineligible for citizenship from owning land in California. The law was primarily aimed towards Japanese farmers who since the 1880s had been hey, immigrating. Yes? Uh, sorry, it looks like the screen might be looking a little weird. Only part of your slide is showing. Oh, it looks fine on my end. Ugh. Okay. I don't quite know how to fix it. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's most of the slide though. So I think, I think we're probably good, so. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I yeah, know, sorry. I don't, I'm not smart enough to how to know how to change the fix, fix the aspect or something like that. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's if, probably fine. If you hit the if you hit the presenting button, it'll let you pick between what you're showing, whether you do your entire screen or window. I'm I'm just doing this the one window. So, can you yeah. maximize it? Um, let's see. Like usually if you double click the top pane of it, yeah. And then go into presenter view. Oh, there we go. Is that, that looks better? better? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can sure. see the full title. Oh, yay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Good. Well, now I will keep forwarding back, get back to where I was. Okay. Um, so the law was um, primarily aimed towards Japanese farmers who since the 1880s had been immigrating to California and other West Coast states. Some of these first generation or Issei came from farming families in Japan with skills in high yield farming from the Pacific Rim. But they were joined by others often pushed into agriculture by anti-Asian unionism and other professional restrictions. By 1840, 43% of West Coast Japanese were employed in agriculture and another 26 in agricultural related businesses like produce stands or nurseries. This was a population that had uh, literally put down their roots into American soil. However, Pearl Harbor would change all of that. In the wake of the attack on December uh, 1941 by the Japanese army, what had been a more general anti-Asian sentiment really flared and focused on people of the Japanese ancestry. In February of 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which allowed the U.S. government to exclude anyone, including citizens, from an area of the U.S. if it was deemed a military necessity. Although the executive order said nothing specifically about people of Japanese ancestry, it was clear they were going to be its target. The Department of War soon established the west coast of the U.S. as an exclusion zone. And throughout the spring of that year, residents of the area would find these notices posted in prominent locations proclaiming that people of Japanese ancestry were to be evacuated, meaning they were to be removed from their homes for an as yet de determined a period of time. Once an exclusion order like this was posted, evacuees had just one week to put their affairs into order. They were allowed to bring only what they could bring and the decision of what to leave and what to uh, bring with them was very difficult. Oral history suggests that among those precious belongings were seeds and even seedlings, a practice that we have found hints of archeologically. After being forced from their homes, internees were first housed in makeshift accommodations, assembly centers that sprung up nearly overnight in locations up and down the West Coast that like these fairgrounds were never meant to house people. And despite the fact that the assembly centers were to be inhabited for only a few months, many imprisoned there embarked embarked almost immediately on uh, planting gardens. 
even though they were unlikely to be there for long. After several months at an assembly center, internees were taken by train uh, during the summer of 1942 to one of 10 quickly built internment camps in the interior of the US. This slide shows the extent of the exclusion zone along the Pacific Rim. The Japanese American population of this area was about 120,000 people, two thirds of whom were born in the US and thus citizens. The map also shows the location of the 10 primary incarceration camps to which the population was sent. These were managed by a civilian agency, the War Relocation Authority or WRA. The official name given by the WRA to the, to the Colorado camp was the Grenada Relocation Center, which is named after the small town, which is very near the camp. But it quickly came to be known by its postal designation, Amachi. Amachi is located in the, center, in the Arkansas River Valley. The central camp area was a square mile enclosed by barbed wire and guarded by armed military guards. Like all 10 of the camps, it was designed to be self-sufficient so as not to tax a system that was already experiencing food shortages. So the entire project area, which you see on this map, included 10 square miles, mostly pre-existing agricultural facilities, including irrigated fields and a working dairy and cattle ranch. These were worked by incarcerees, uh, like the gentleman you see in the upper right-hand corner here, who were paid a very minimal salary, typically between 12 and $14 a month. The central camp area is located on a, on a sandy terrace above the valley floor. It's minimally productive land that since the 1870s had primarily been used for grazing cattle. Native vegetation are hardy plants like the yucca that's featured in this Amachi silkscreen shop graphic. In fact, every one of the trees that you see in the site overview um, does not belong here. It was planted by an internee. The camp's semi-arid and windy environment, which was often the bane of Amachians, ironically has served to protect the historic camp landscape after it closed and the buildings were dismantled in 1945. After the war, the land was not developed and the sandy native soil blew in and protected historic features and living surfaces. In recognition of its historic significance and its physical integrity, Amachi is now a national historic landmark, which is the highest recognition of a historic site in the US. What I'll be sharing with you today comes from six field seasons and 15 years of community collaboration. And I want you to notice the rogue on the right-hand side there on this picture. Um, it incorporates what we have learned by working side by side and talking to Amachi survivors and their families. Many of the photographs that I'll uh, be showing you have been carefully saved by families and then generously shared with the DU Amachi project. The synergy of working with community members is what I love so much about this research. It has made the enterprise both scientifically and ethically sound, and it also makes it a really important avenue for training future generations of archeologists. Uh, we focused our studies primarily in the areas where the incarcerees lived, in the barracks blocks. Um, this helps us better understand daily life and the strategy of incarcerees for making the camp a more livable place. We've also surveyed public blocks such as the elementary school and the sports fields, as well as undeveloped areas that were used for informal trash disposal. We specifically chose to survey some blocks occupied by people from the three main population areas who ended up at Amachi. So those are the Japanese American residents of the regions in magenta on this map, the sort of Northern coastal area of um, Los Angeles, which uh, housed many people who were sort of, uh, who often worked in the poultry, um, industry, they raised chickens um, or worked uh, picked hops in the Central Valley. Um, we have a big portion of the Central Valley, particularly Merced, Merced County, um, which was uh, the home to a number of uh, very uh, large and um, prosperous Japanese farms that were part of a, an early farming colony. Um, and then the LA population came from a, a neighborhood of truck farms and produce stands. Um, there were other professionals who lived there, including professional landscapers and gardeners. Uh, we begin each field season doing a systematic pedestrian survey. So we're re at a really close interval, basically uh, a two meter interval, you know, it's kind of fingertip to fingertip. Um, as the crew goes through, they scan for objects on the surface and they call out what they find so that we create an inventory of items seen in each block. Um, during the survey, uh, crews flag items that would benefit from additional analysis um, or otherwise related to our research questions like those that are related to the landscape studies. 
Uh, each of these flagged artifacts um, is documented in the field. Um, and uh, we collect only a very few um, that are related um, to, that could benefit from, from even further analysis um, or could be used in public education. Uh, while we're doing the survey, crews are looking for activity areas visible on the surface, especially gardens and last landscaping features. So some of these, like the one on this slide, utilize the same concrete out of which the barracks uh, foundations were constructed, which is the concrete alignment that you see behind the garden. Um, but others are marked by trees, plants, um, or stone outlines. We document the more complicated uh, gardens and landscaping features with scaled measured drawings and um, learning to, to produce these maps are, is an important part of the student training. Uh, our finds are also um, mapped with digital equipment so that we can uh, create extremely accurate maps of the blocks that we have surveyed as well as the location of our excavation units. Uh, so this is an example of the digital maps that we've been creating. Uh, they help us see the larger spatial relationships at camp by mapping uh, building foundations, uh, which are what you see here in the yellow, uh, locations of landscaping, which is what you see um, outlined in um, the purple, um, and then individual locations of important objects or concentrations of objects. These maps uh, show a common pattern, which is that gardens associated with barracks tend to be located in the front of buildings, um, as well as in the centralized areas of the block. But we also see a few, um, as you can see here, that are kind of located at the ends of barracks or in other locations. And uh, the other thing that this map shows you is just how common such gardens are. It is more likely that there's a garden in front of a barrack than that there's not a garden in front of a barrack. And sometimes I think when we don't see them, it's just because they're, um, they're not, uh, they no longer remain visible on the surface. Uh, historic photographs support our findings from the survey and make it clear that incarceries didn't just change the landscape of the camp while they were there, they radically transformed it. And knowing that from the outside of the project, I was really interested in how Amachians were taking their expertise and growing things, as well as the values and aesthetics um, from uh, Japanese tradition and applying it to this entirely new um, environment of the high plains of Colorado. Uh, I was also interested in what the landscaping features revealed about connections and strategies, both inside and outside of camp for a situation of upheaval um, and material shortage. And the garden features at Amachi, like those at the other WRA camps, uh, tend to fall into three types. Um, so the first are entryway gardens uh, found near the uh, doorways of barracks, like you saw in the overall digital map. These gardens have their roots in the courtyard or Subaniwa gardens of Japan. And yet they also reflect the front yard um, that gardeners of Japanese ancestry were creating for their clients um, and for themselves in the west coast of the US. The second type of garden in the camps are ornamental gardens in common areas of the block, such as those along the edges of mess halls or in front of the recreation buildings. At Amachi, these are often located near the bathhouse to take advantage of the water provided by the one spigot um, available that was adjacent to that building. Uh, the final kind of gardens are vegetable gardens, which during the war uh, were called victory gardens, both inside and outside of camp. So beginning in 2008, we started conducting test excavations in each of these different kinds of gardens. And so far we have excavated over a dozen. Um, some of these garden features we can identify using historic photographs, like this one that's taken from the camp's water tower. Um, others we have just a hint of on the surface of the site. And in both instances, we've employed um, ground penetrating radar or GPR prior to excavation. And I have to give a big nod to my colleague, Larry Conyers, who both trains my st students in how to do this, but also has each year um, uh, volunteered and donated his equipment for our use at Amachi. Uh, and um, the GPR at Amachi has been really important because it helps us to um, decide whether or not um, what we're looking at in the surface is in fact a garden and whether it's worth excavating. Um, so uh, a great example is this garden, um, which is the first one that we excavated in 2010, 
uh, we had just a little hint of uh, a garden wall uh, on the surface of the site and the rest of it was obscured. But then when we did GPR, it was clear that not only did we have, we had two paired oval garden beds, but that they were also garden beds and not ponds because as you can see with the GPR here, the soil on the inside and outside of that wall um, is the same, which if it had a concrete bottom that was obscured, it would look very differently. Um, after analyzing the GPR data, we, um, if it looks like the feature has integrity, then we open up test excavations, um, employing really intensive garden archaeology techniques. So each of these excavation units that the um, my crew are working in here are uh, two by two. Um, and we do tend to lay them out in a checkerboard pattern like this, um, because that way we can start to assess, we can open up a larger area um, and try to uh, assess a little bit more about what is planted um, in these features, as well as how um, they are planned. And um, in addition to screening um, the soil to look for objects used in the gardens, we also consistently take soil samples throughout. So a lot of that we process through a flotation tank. So you can see there's a big bag of, uh, the yellow bag is sandbag, and that's the what we take our, our um, soil samples in, and then we float them here in the, in the field so that we can recover the organic matter from the top, as well as the, um, the, the inorganic and, and sort of smaller micro artifacts um, from these gardens, which have often proved um, to be uh, very interesting as well. Um, in addition to the larger uh, flotation samples, we take uh, smaller um, soil samples that are sent um, to um, for both pollen and phytolith analysis. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, phytoliths are the silical bodies that provide structural support for many plants. And um, they the, the two of those um, together have been um, quite powerful for understanding what, uh, along with the macrobotanical remains that we recover from flotation for what was planted in these gardens. Um, the soils at Amachi are classified by the Soil Conservation Service as overly drained sands, and they are low in organics and nutrients. So to assess if and how the incarceries were amending the soil, which is a really important application of horticultural expertise, um, we instituted a program of soil chemistry sampling um, as well. And to answer our questions about soil chemistry, it's not enough to look in the gardens, but we also had to look um, off-site and out of garden settings. Take a, we dug a bunch of control pits. Uh, our first excavation, um, as I said, back in 2008 was in one of these two matching oval beds. Um, they're located in the public area in the center of block 9L that you see on this map. And that block was one of the more remote areas of camp um, and home to a population almost entirely from Los Angeles. Um, a former incarcerate who lived in the block as a young man recalled that there were many cosmopolitan um, uh, single young ladies who had uh, were worldly and smoked cigarettes and had been waitresses when they were in LA. And along with the music that was played at night, they helped inspire the nickname of that block, which was Chinatown. Um, and uh, we uh, sort of found some great evidence of the, uh, the kind of uh, music, the way that the music that was played there that would waft across the site uh, when we found a tone dial for a radio or a stereo during um, survey. Uh, the excavation revealed a number of important aspects about this garden. Uh, the garden walls are actually made of cinder blocks that were carefully split into four pieces. A few whole examples remain around the site, but as used in the garden, they were very deliberately cut and shaped. Um, and as buried and modified, they actually look like a fairly passable mock basalt, which would be a much more typical material for a Japanese garden. And this was one of our first chances to see the ingenuity of Amachi's garden designers and how they transformed materials in the gardens. Uh, the layout of the garden as revealed in the excavation was also something of a surprise. Counter to the ideas of typical uh, Japanese design, this garden had a studied symmetry from the oval bed itself to the plantings within it. A single planting hole right there in the center yielded um, the uh, intact root mold of a Chinese elm. Uh, and a piece of valuable and likely surreptitiously obtained 
uh, copper wire because copper was uh, rationed during the war uh, was found uh, nearby and tied uh, and next to a stain in the soil from a decaying wood. So we found the wooden stake and the wire that was used to um, hold up that tree, which was um, something that in a in the very windy high plains would have helped to uh, promote the the um, the health and well-being of this um, Chinese elm. We also found a hook of the kind that you could use to hang lanterns um, in, a, in a tree like that. Uh, as we were excavating, a shockingly red uh, nail polish vial was uncovered during the excavations. And all I could think of was those um, worldly women that a teenager recalled uh, sharing his block with, sitting in there painting their nails. Um, a, a small coal fire pit was revealed immediately outside the planting bed and sake jug fragments, officially prohibited, still littered the surface near the garden. Each piece adds to a visceral impression of a small place where a kind of conviviality could be had in the midst of institutional confinement. Uh, the botanical remains recovered from the oval garden indicate it likely had a deliberately planted ground cover of wild purslane. Um, purslane seeds um, occurred only in the planting hole fill and the lower fills within the planting bed itself. Um, while purslane is not especially associated with Japanese gardening traditions, um, it is a drought tolerant and moderately attractive ground cover. Uh, after the excavations were complete, we met a man who not only require, recalled the 9L Olive Gardens, he sent us these family pictures taken in front of the garden. These document the visit of two servicemen on leave after basic training, and they also show the tree that we excavated. <laughs> um, these uh, men were uh, back visiting their family at Amachi before uh, being shipped out to fight in Europe. And these Amachians chose to capture this important moment of their family's history in front of a garden, an element that masked the official camp landscape. And Anna Tamura, a landscape architect for the National Park Service, has noted that this is practice is common in photos from other camps as well. And it recalls what Jean Wakasuki Houston wrote about the Manzanar Gardens, that when you were in them and facing away from the barracks, quote, you could for a while not be a prisoner at all, unquote. Uh, one of the most important ways that the DU Amachi project assists in the management of the site is by investigating areas that will um, be impacted by planned um, site developments. Uh, so we're, we help them uh, do their section 106 um, compliance um, at the site. Uh, this photograph uh, below was taken from, again, another one from the camp's water tower, um, which was due to be rebuilt and returned. And because of the photos from that, we knew that there were gonna be these gardens nearby and that as workers were gonna be coming in with all of this heavy equipment, that we wanted to be able to protect that garden. So we needed to know exactly where it was um, on the ground. Um, so again, we use GPR to identify this garden, which is a little bit trickier than when you're doing GPR with hardscaping like rock, when all we have is a light um, wood and wire fence. But by God, if we did not find this beautiful point source <laughs> reflection, um, and also kudos to my crew who are more than happy, well, they're, they're not more than happy, but we trim down all of the vegetation so that we can um, get a really good um, connection uh, and that we're not uh, getting a bunch of interference. Uh, we also run these um, GPR antenna at a very close interval so that we can pick up these um, often uh, pretty, uh, um, ephemeral sig signatures in, uh, in this case, um, in the GPR profile. Uh, so when we opened this area up for test excavations, we were super pleased to have find this alignment of wire and wood that is the remnants of the fence that once um, uh, ran around this uh, garden. Um, and uh, we, the other reason I was so pleased to find this uh, pieces of this fence is that this very sandy matrix, um, the pollen uh, can really be percolated down um, to the layers down below our, um, our, our archeological soils. So we're always looking for places where we, in the gardens where we have something that serves as an umbrella to capture the pollen. And so, we picked up this piece of wood and I just hogged out. We took all sorts of pollen uh, samples underneath there. And guess what we found? Potatoes. So 
as uh, they were growing potatoes in this um, uh, victory garden. Um, and the other thing that they were doing that I think was uh, amazing is just th that they were incredibly, um, uh, the soil chemistry was fantastic in terms of it was so much higher in both uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And also the pH was more neutral um, than the parent soil. And so they had worked really hard in this garden to create a, a situation where they could, um, they could productively grow potatoes. Uh, and because we knew where the edge of the garden was, when we closed up these excavation units, we flagged this entire area so that we could protect it as the, um, the water tower was replaced. Uh, that same summer, we also excavated a portion of this garden, um, which is directly in front of the barrack occupied by Siachiro and Boone Hirota. Um, they were at a couple in their 70s who had managed a furniture store in Los Angeles. And as we dug, it became clear that the soil in this garden was amended throughout with the judicious use of crumbled eggshell. Uh, a former incarcerate who visited, visited us that summer recalled that eggshell, tea leaves, coffee grounds, these were all highly priced soil amendments. But she pointed out, and something I hadn't really thought about, is that not everyone has access to them. You have to know somebody who, or be somebody who works in the mess halls. Um, another source for the eggshell could have been the chicken raising uh, facilities at the ra uh, ranch um, associated with the camp. Um, they would also have had access. Uh, if you have access to chickens, you have access to, to eggshells. Um, the Harota garden also employed broken water pipes, which is what you see here. And that's like the collar of, a, of an earthenware, um, a stoneware uh, water pipe. And it's ingeniously sort of placed upright um, with the collar sunk into the ground. Um, and it, and it used, looks pretty much like a planter. Um, uh, because they were certainly broken before the gardeners got a hold of them, they likely reflect another connection. This one to someone who had access to the camp's trash, um, like those who worked for the sanitation division. Um, and it's unlikely that the 70-year-old uh, couple who we found here worked either in the mess hall or uh, for the san uh, were taking the trash out. And so one of the things it shows us is the networks that gardeners employed um, to be able to have the things that they needed to, um, to make their gardens. Uh, one of the many surprises revealed by the gardens of Amachi are about the relationship of incarceries to the larger physical and social environment. Um, they made great use of materials that were available near but beyond the barbed wire perimeter of the camp. So lots of gar gardens include river cobble and gravel from the Arkansas River, which was next to the, some of the fields, but, but from the camp itself is, is about three miles away. Um, but we also find transplanted wild species like this choya in this entryway garden. And uh, when I was mapping this, uh, this garden, a local rancher came up and he pointed at that choya and he said, that doesn't belong here. And I was like, yes, that is my thought precisely. And you know, if anybody knows which, uh, which cacti belong or don't belong, it's ranchers. So. Um, it's, uh, I don't know how far away they would have had to go, but he, he assured me it, it would have been a ways. But other gardens even evidence greater movement in, of incarceries. Uh, geological sourcing has allowed us to identify many uh, stones that were transported to Amachi. Um, so the, the one at the top is uh, from a, a a geological source probably about 40 miles away, um, one place where the Boy Scouts uh, we know had gone camping. So uh, this may have been uh, from a foray there. And uh, the low, the um, quartz on the lower um, edge is actually of the, because it's not uh, softened at all, the, it hasn't been rolled or transported. This has probably been picked up um, from the foothills uh, of the Rockies. Uh, and these I, I love because they help us remember that the camp is more porous and that people are allowed to get out on work permits and to do things like camp with the Boy Scouts. Or uh, we know that there was a, some of the um, Christian uh, kids at Amachi went to uh, Bible camp in the foothills of the Rockies and that may be where um, this uh, quartz uh, came from. Uh, one of our 
other exciting uh, findings and one that we got from two different gardens. Uh, in, in one week, it came from pollen data and the other came from phytolith, um, are the remains of canna, which is a flowering tropical plant that's related to ginger. And it has absolutely no business growing on the high plains of Colorado. Um, but it grows wild throughout the Hawaiian islands. Uh, many of the families at Amachi had ties to Hawaii, which had a larger population of people of Japanese ancestry than, than that of the continental U.S. Um, but because the vast majority of Japanese Hawaii were not incarcerated during the war, they could have done things like gathered canna roots and send them to their friends and family. Its presence at Amachi may indicate um, an amazing effort put into procuring plants that would make this place both a little more beautiful and a little less foreign. Most of these gardens were not made by experts um, in Japanese garden design, but they are shaped by traditional philosophy such as motenai, the idea that reuse is a virtue and waste is a shame. So like the Hirota garden that used broken pipe, this garden employed trash to make art. In this case, it was broken tile used as decorative paving. A few of the Amachi gardens were made by experts, like the gentleman who designed this entryway garden we excavated in 2012. Before the war, one of them had owned a nursery and um, uh, that uh, grew cactus um, another had been a gardener for the LA Railway. Um, the feature is a great example of the way that Japanese garden design can be translated in even the most inhospitable settings. Um, this appears to be an innovative example of a centuries old Japanese gardening technique of ikidori or capturing alive. And so uh, I hope you can see the, the impression of the prickly pear cactus in this um, concrete um, and by by using ikidori, um, they could bring uh, a cactus into an entryway garden without having the danger of having to walk past a cactus every day. And I love the idea of this millennial old technique being accommodated by the often unlovely material of concrete. And I think it has even more resonance when we know that at least one of the gardeners who made this space was an expert in growing cactus. The younger gener uh, generation of incarcerees was also involved in efforts to landscape the camp. After controversy over the cost of a specialty built Amachi High School, the WRA abandoned plans to build an elementary school. Instead, a regular barracks block was pressed into service for the youngest students in the camp. An article published by the school administrators indicated that the students themselves initiated the program of widespread landscaping at the school. This effort was cast in published accounts as a reflection of the American ideals promoted by the WRA education program. And certainly the overall landscaping scene that resulted would have um, been reassuring um, to Western uh, administrators. Uh, our intensive survey of the block suggests a, a real similarity in the size placement and the boundary hardscaping of all the individual beds that used this um, uh, limestone that you see edging these beds here that these little girls are scratching soil into. Um, but the excavations um, of a pair of blanks, a bed that flank one classroom uh, tells us a different story. So uh, these, uh, the designs for each of these rooms, for each of these gardens was presented by the students themselves. They were voted on by uh, judges and then um, students were able to put into place um, their designs. And um, these beds are that, that we two that we uh, excavated on either side of a doorway um, were approximately the same size. They both had limestone outlines, but one was landscaped consistently um, with gravel from the banks of the Arkansas River. And then one that ne was next to it had no gravel at all. Um, one of them, we, we recovered ornamental morning glory seeds from, um, but none from the other. And these very different school gardens suggest that uh, these young people are already developing their own landscape aesthetic, and they are carrying on the tradition of the Suboniwa in a most unlikely place. Uh, I consider one of my primary tasks as an archaeologist to notice patterns in the material traces of humans' behaviors and then try to explain them. And over the course of six seasons of archaeological research at Amachi, one of the most robust patterns is the ubiquity of gardens. And every single block occupied by the Japanese Americans confined at Amachi, we have uncovered gardens of different size, composition, and complexity. 
Uh, there are a lot of answers to the question of why there are so many gardens at Amachi. And some of them are quotidian. So uh, veggies from Victory Gardens add variety to a mess hall diet. Um, the picture that you see here of, uh, is of a family and uh, one of the, the sons, um, George, uh, recalled his mom growing, uh, growing cucumbers in their family garden so that she could turn them into pickles. Um, gardens also keep the grit down in this region that was only just coming out of the Dust Bowl. And evapor evaporation from ponds like the one you see here would have created more equitable microclimates. And fast growing plants like those morning glories that we found at the school hide shabby institutional architecture. But the energy poured into these gardens suggests to me that there's something deeper at play. And my study of Japanese garden history and of horticultural therapy has convinced me that gardening was ideally suited to help the people of Japanese ancestry imprisoned at Amachi cope with a nearly unlivable situation. They were in a world where the social ground was constantly shifting. One day they were high school students or farmers or optometrists, and the next they were prisoners with no idea when or if they might be released. Those who were immigrants were people uh, without a country while their children were citizens of a country that had turned its back on them. But they had skills honed over generations to bring harmony to at least one little part of their world, their gardens. And in 2012, we excavated what turned out to be a stunning Japanese style entryway garden. One of the reasons that I chose to further investigate this was this primary feature uh, right here, this garden wall that evokes stone, um, but is in fact uh, made of concrete slabs and it is a skillful evocation of a miniaturized um, mountain range, but it's also cited in an especially interesting manner. Um, the designers created mindfulness by placing the, do the door not to one side or the other, but right in front of the barrack wall, uh, the, excuse me, the barrack doorway. And then when we removed this, uh, this blown in sand, we discovered this beautiful cedar walkway that led directly from the doorway to the wall. And from there, there were stepping stones that um, suggested pathways to either side. And each time the residents served by this doorway transitioned between the world outside and the world inside their barrack, they would have had to slow down to be aware and present for at least that moment. And that is the kind of mindfulness that is often one of the goals of traditional Japanese garden design. Another element of harmony created by the Amachi gardeners is the kind of deep balance that we've discovered through our study of soil chemistry. Um, we found all sorts of interesting amendments, not just eggshell, but also marine shell, fish bones and scales, and even pieces of iron slag from the blacksmith shop. And in almost every single garden feature that we have so far analyzed, the soil retains more nutrients that support plant life than the soil from control pits in non-garden areas or outside the site. And considering the rapidity with which nutrients are washed from this sandy matrix and the short duration of the camp's occupation, only three years, this imprint is nothing short of amazing. There remains 70 years later, later a legacy of care for the land by a people who were forced to inhabit it. To really grapple with the Amachi Gardens, or with any garden, we must not think just about the art, but the act. The physicality of creating and maintaining a garden is another of its virtues. The daily chores of watering and seasonal efforts like picking up fallen leaves or harvesting vegetables uh, or covering them so they don't frost <laughs> with your early frost. Um, these are all acts that keep a garden in harmony, but they also keep the people engaging them in harmony. Um, physiological studies have shown time and time again that engaging with plants uh, reduces heart rate and cortisol levels. And in that way, science and Japanese garden philosophy, as expressed by this quote from the very first designer of a Zen garden temple, converged in what to me is a really interesting way. In taking care of their gardens, Amachians not only took care of themselves, they took care of each other. And when faced with uncertainty, they put their, help, their hope in each other and in nature. And the picture that comes from the gardens of Amachi is that of resourceful, imaginative, and skilled people. They turned an oppressive and monotonous environment into one that was useful. And despite being singled out for their ancestry, they did not abandon it, but they expressed it in both traditional and new ways. And so they've left for us a legacy of dignity, an insistence on their own humanity, despite outside forces bent on destroying it. And that is a legacy from which we can all learn. 
So uh, here again, here's the shameless plug. Um, what I've shared with you today is a taste of what's explored in more detail in my forthcoming book. And um, if you get it while, before it actually is published, which is, should be happening in the next month or so, um, you can uh, get it at a 40% discount, which really makes it, even as an academic book, um, almost uh, affordable. Uh, the other plug I want to put in is that as advocates for Colorado archaeology, I'd also like to appeal to you to help us uh, preserve um, the gardens and all the archaeological resources of Amachi for the future. And you can do that by submitting a comment to the Amachi Special Resource Study that's being conducted right now by the National Park Service through February. Um, they want to hear from a wide range of the public. You don't have to be Japanese American or even to have ever been to, uh, to Amachi um, to speak up for it. Um, and I will share this link with Katie so she can put it on the Indian Peaks um, website. Um, and uh, here is uh, some of the, I always say it takes a village to do archaeology. And uh, here's my village, uh, some of the groups who have funded the work and also the people who have made it possible. And um, I also have some uh, links here for more information about the project and of course our ubiquitous Facebook page. And I do hope that we're going to get in the field this summer. Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> and I have, um, I've talked to some of the cast chapters about doing um, tours, and that would be something I'd be happy to help um, arrange with you guys uh, if uh, the next time um, that we're in the field. Uh, so with that, I'm going to quit sharing my screen so that you guys can have. Um, in case anybody has some questions. Actually, Bonnie, if you want to keep that screen with the links open or the book links, that might give people time to, to find them. Oh, sure. Oh, well, then I better open it back up. <laughs> give me just a second. <laughs> um, maybe somebody can ask a question while I'm doing that. Yeah, so usually we have folks enter questions into the chat box, but y'all are welcome to just ask your question to Bonnie. Well, I'll ask mine. Yeah, I've got a <laughs> list, so we can oh. come back to me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so Bonnie, obviously, you know, I got to work out there and stuff. And, and the other day I was actually thinking and was thinking about, you know, how much, and, and obviously we've seen it in, in your presentation, how much stuff there is that people are reusing and whatnot. But we also know that Amache, there, there were people, people had access to mail order catalogs. And I think in reference to gardening, have has there ever been any artifacts that are found that look like they were purposely purchase to be used in a garden? Uh, yeah, there definitely were. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm just, it does not want to let me uh, share this again. Um, yeah, so we have some, there's, you know, it, it, that's an era, particularly, you know, if you think about the, there's a lot of those like McCoy and kind of art pottery plant pots Mm -hmm. And we found the base to at least like two of those. So people were mm -hmm. buying some like specialty made things like that. And then um, there is some oral history about the fact that, um, gosh, my screen does not want to do the right thing. Um, that there was, uh, that people are ordering seeds from seeds themselves from catalogs. So they're ordering seeds from Sears Roebuck. Um, I right, think, yeah. like the the garden that mm -hmm. was over by Amachi Town Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. All right, Katie, now you go. I don't want to hog, so Katie. Um, if anybody else wants to jump in first, that's fine. And I'm just going to apologize. I, it does not want to let me present my screen again, so um, I, I can send you those links and Sure. Can share them later. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, we'll all start. So there seems to me to be like multiple purposes for these gardens. Do you think 
after looking at or evaluating the the side of Amache, that it's more about like victory, victory gardens and food production or more about like mindfulness and the practice of gardening or or what proportion like what have you seen in those in those breakdowns well it seems like um it's probably more common for there to be ornamental gardens than vegetable gardens. That said, there also appears to be gardens that are doing both. So like, um, I love the first time we found canna was actually in a vegetable and what was a victory garden. Um, so they're probably growing, you know, ornamental plants in among um, the edible ones and, um, and there's also, you know, um, in terms of thinking about just like wellness, uh, just just having shade. So one of the things that we, areas that we've excavated is um, we found evidence of, a, of an extensive tree line that was on the south side of a building. And it's interesting because it's like the public space in this block and the area that would have been really visible to everybody else would have been on the north side of this building, but that's not where we found the trees. We found them on the south side. And so that way the trees were shading that building and it turns out that building was a preschool. So you've got these little tots in these buildings that are not very well insulated. And so by, um, by having those trees in there, they were making it a lot more pleasant for those kids. And those and the shady areas are used. And, you know, Christian has, has, I saw this when we were out there, is that we often find, that's where we find marbles, we find go tokens. We, there's a lot of evidence that people are hanging out in the shade of these trees. And that, you know, in the high desert um, and people who are coming from places that like, like if you're from the Bay Area, <laughs> like, the high plains of Colorado was a shock to the system. And so to have a little bit more shade um, is really, really important. Um, and so, but I, I think it's just, I think it's really hard to separate all that stuff out. Um, I think that um, it's, it's probably all kind of rolled together for people. I mean, the other thing that it's doing is it's helping them pass the time in a way that's a little, um, that, is you know connects them to nature's cycle, and I, I kind of been inspired in thinking about that by work that's been done on prison gardens, and you know there's a reason that they call it doing time in the prison. Time's not your friend, um, but when you're in the gardens, then you're you're linked into cyclical time, right? And things and it's amazing to me how many how many blossoming the 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 pollen of blossoming trees we have found. Like really, you're gonna. <laughs> You're gonna invest in a blossoming tree um, in your prison? Sure, okay. Um, and they did. And those kinds of things, you know, again, they would have marked time in this sort of reassuring um, manner. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another question I had was on the topic of thermoregulation, which you, you definitely address with the preschool. Um, I'm wondering if there were other I guess, aspects of the garden that, that might have played a role in it, especially like water features or maybe like yeah. shrubby, mm -hmm. like non-tree mm -hmm. woody features. Well, yeah. So like, like those, um, you know, st things that are vines that grow up, you know, they're going to, of course, um, help these buildings that aren't very well insulated um, stay cooler. Uh, and, um, and, and, one of the things is that actually is that this pattern is even stronger at some of the other camps. So, um, so there's um, now someone who's doing his PhD uh, at Gila river and there, I mean, there, so they're in air, the lower Sonoran desert, so hot out there. And, um, and the buildings were actually built up on stilts as opposed to Adamachi where they are on these concrete foundations. And so they were digging um, uh, ponds all the way underneath these buildings. 
so that then when they filled them up, they were getting this evaporative cooling, um, which is something that they, they couldn't do at Amachi, um, but, they, um, but they did do, you know, a certain um, amount of it. Um, the other thing that they're doing that's really fun is that um, some of these gardens are not just for, um, uh, to encourage uh, plant life, but also animal life. So people are, you know, they're trying to draw in birds. They have bird houses. Um, they're uh, capturing, there's, there's a lots of little turtles out there, like little um, uh, box turtles that people remember that they would catch and they would build, build little ponds for them. So, and, and so they would hang out um, in front of their house. Um, so uh, there's, um, you know, they're, they're trying to bring nature in, in, in multiple ways. I didn't even think of that. That's wonderful. Um, I, I don't want to keep going if other people have questions about I have more. <laughs> okay, I have a question based off of what Bonnie just said. <laughs> go back to go. Okay, so, um, so talking about like all the different changes on the landscape and different things like that. So can you speak a little bit to like how they were able to maybe this comes more out of the ethnographic record but like how they were able to deal with like what they were allowed to do versus what they like how they got through the situation so like it's basically the, i mean they i mean if they're digging holes under the buildings and ordering seeds from sears and roebuck like they're they're kind of like putting it to the like guards <laughs> at the place <laughs> so uh what, what what's that balance like how how was that dealt with well it's interesting because the the gardening for the most part is kind of encouraged by um or at least not actively discouraged by administrators um they are sometimes concerned about how much water gets used. And so there's sometimes kind of fights about mm -hmm. that. Um, but uh, there's, but there's a bunch of other stuff that's going on and Christian can kind of speak to that because he did his thesis on sake production in the camp. Um, and so, um, so essentially you've got, you've got guards that are guarding the outside of the camp but the inside, the police force is a volunteer police force of, um, of internees themselves. And, and, and there's just a lot of stuff that just, they just kind of turn a blind eye to because otherwise it's just, um, I think they just understand that it, that, that it would all kind of fall apart. Um, so again, all, so, all the, so I will say that is that we find so many materials that are essentially purloined. And um, like one of the um, the men who lived at Amachi, he called it midnight requisitioning. So there's a lot of midnight requisitioning to get the materials that you need to improve your barracks, to build your garden. Um, there is, you are not supposed to cook in your barracks and they are cooking all the time in their barracks. Um, they are not supposed to have alcohol, but they are brewing alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, and part of this is, and, and I, I should turn it over to Christian because he really looked at like, when do they, when do they step in and when do they let it kind of ride? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, what, with my thesis, I did a lot of looking at any records I could get my hands on and was fortunate to have both the internal, like, internee government records, but also the records for the security of office. And, and also cross-referencing that with the internal camp newspapers, really, I mean, I came away with an impression that, uh, uh, of, of the administration kind of feeling that they just wanted things to run. <laughs> and, you know, that there, there were people in the administration who, who were involved in this, who, you know, had certainly different feelings than the, than the people who, who made the decision to put uh, people in these camps. So I think there was a little bit of leniency on that. I think there's also, I think also you can't deny the impact of, of something like, I mean, yes, this is a, a, a camp where people have been put against their will, but, you know, having 
it, it was set up with the with an internal internee council and you know like bonnie was saying the security officers most of them were were internees so that's a big dynamic too but i think really at the end of the day i think people in the administration realized that they were dealing with what could be a very volatile situation on their hands and that they chose more often than not to just let things ride until it got to a point <laughs> and that point would usually be and I saw that in my research with with uh, alcohol because that point would be drinking and and getting in fights, um, selling alcohol for grossly in inflated profits. That's the sort of stuff that I saw them go after. But people just, you know, drinking during a, a wedding or you know during New Year's or something like that. And certainly, as we've been talking about all the things they did to their barracks, they seem to be looking the other way just to, I think, keep the peace. Thank you. So speaking of keeping the peace, why were the worldly girls um, with the nail polish bottle? And I think it was 9L. Why was that area called Chinatown? <laughs> well, because Chinatown is where you go to drink and gamble. <laughs> Even if you're Japanese American. I'm not worldly enough to know these things being from Greeley. Oh, you don't know that there's a, so you just need to listen to, there's a song called Chinatown, My Chinatown. Um, that's like from the forties. Um, yeah. So, and, and often actually Japan towns and Chinatowns were, were close to each other. So, mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, so people who, uh, this is a population who, who knew kind of what went on in, um, in Chinatown. So yeah, it was a little bit of a, uh, a slam and, and, a, and a reminder that, you know, just because you have been um, singled out for your ethnicity doesn't mean that you also don't make fun of other people for theirs. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay. I'll have to listen to that. So did you find any, anything to point towards like, you know, a, a plant market um, trading, like rock trading, like especially with that quartz from the foothills, like there's got to be some kind of market going on. You know, I, I certainly didn't see anything like that. And I, it's kind of like with Christian, like, you know, if you are making sake and then you're sharing it, that's fine. But if you're sort of like extorting your neighbors, then it's not okay. And um, I, I, I just don't know that, and, and people don't have a whole lot in terms of economic resources, right? And so mm -hmm. I think this is, I think this really is a lot about people going out and when they're out, they find cool stuff and then they bring it home. Um, and um, it, the, the thing that I, I didn't include cause it's like just crazy, crazy um, backstory, but we found this big hunk of obsidian actually that we think came by way of uh, another internment camp. And so, because people were in a different camp and then they got transferred into Amachi, but it's very near a big obsidian source. And that's where that, um, that big hunk of obsidian came from. So, um, and to kind of delve, a, to do a deep dive. Um, so in the history of Japanese gardens, a lot of the people who do that history say that the that the kind of the whole concept of the Japanese garden actually goes back to Shintoism, uh, which is a kind of series of folk beliefs um, that are very very old, and um, and there's a belief that there's a there's a it's it's kind of like the force. <laughs> it's called kami, and it exists specifically in trees and mountains and stone. And so that, so these, so, so like concrete is going to do in a garden, but it's never going to have the kami of actual stone. And so I think that's part of the reason why when, when people went out and they saw these beautiful pieces of stone, they're like, they, not only are they beautiful, they, they have, they have like this intense spirit and that, and to bring that into your garden helps to bring, to make your garden just that much more powerful. 
Um, so gardens are definitely tied to spiritual practice um, as well. That's really interesting. Uh, on that note, what was the most unexpected thing that you found that could be considered part of a garden? Uh, it was the slag, the, the pieces of slag from the blacksmith shop that were scattered throughout um, the garden, multiple gardens in the same block. I was like, I, I, I was dumbfounded to find that. And it was one of my graduate students who did a little bit of research and um, uh, concrete leaches iron out of the soil. And especially the certain flowering plants, um, roses and things that are in the rose family, which we know people mm -hmm. are growing at um, Adamachi, um, want to have a kind of in iron enriched soil. So they must have, again, known somebody who worked at the blacksmith shop, gone in and gotten some of the, just like the leavings from the blacksmith shop and then sprinkled them into their garden. Like that's, that's commitment. <laughs> so like more of an amendment rather than. Yeah, that uh, more of a more of a soil amendment. I, I will say that when we when I got the pollen results and they told me we had canna, I was like, "You're you are lying to me. How could we yeah. possibly have canna?" Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Not no. at all. And not no. only did they grow it, they grew it well enough that it flowered and and had pollen. Right? It, this is a plant that yeah. survived out there, which is yeah. crazy that must have been that must have taken up so much time and labor to cultivate canna plus everything else like it it sounds like this was a primary activity of oh life. yeah i mean people talked about that and in fact um uh there was i, I read one letter from the administration when um they were like trying to move somebody from trying to encourage somebody to move from one spot in camp to the another and they were like i am not leaving my garden I'm oh. really hard on this. I'm not moving. I so understand as a recent, like, first time homeowner. I'm so excited mm -hmm. for my garden. Yeah, but but I have to say this. In and I, I will say, and this is I'm going to put this plug in for uh, for all of us archaeologists is we need to be paying more attention to our horticultural soil and thinking about the soil as an artifact. And I just was reading about some excavations at a coal mining site in, mm -hmm. in um, uh, Pennsylvania where they were living in, these miners were living in company housing. They were, had these big vegetable gardens. And then when they moved out <laughs> into their own places, they took their dirt. They scooped it <laughs> up because yeah. they been working so hard and they'd been amending it and yeah. they took it with them. It's and an I, anthracol. I love that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Use it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot so, of hard work and living. And so I think that in places where we, and, and you know, it, it, it's something that, that I would like to do. And like that, that, that block that I showed you where we, um, we've got, we've got um, it appear to be gardens everywhere except two barracks. Mm -hmm. I think we could go into the, that barrack area that doesn't, appear to have gardens on the surface. And I think if we did soil chemistry, we would see soil amendment, which then we could use as a proxy for garden. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, there's so much more fun work to do with this. Oh <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, like I said, I, I, I could talk about it all night. So I, ho I hope I didn't go too long. I didn't actually time myself. I should have, because this is, this is like, I'm working on my job talk. So if any of not my job talk, I have a job. I'm working on my book talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if any of you have suggestions for the book talk, things that I left out or did it go too long or too short? Uh, Bonnie, this is Becca. Um, I don't have another question at the moment, but I'm sure if I rattled my brain, I could. But uh, I just wanted to say, you know, this is one of the, like, premier archaeology projects, especially from, like, a, like, community and educational base. Like, I feel like it's just impacted so many people, and I wanted to thank you for that because, like, it 
I didn't know much about the project before I was an intern at History Colorado and like gave tours to people at um, at the museum. But you know, since having to teach people about the the site or specifically fourth graders about the site, I mean, so many great grad students have come out of it. So many great connections. Your pro- programs and presentations always include these amazing uh, stories of the descendants and the students working together that I just, it's just so great. And so I wanted to make sure you heard that in a voice and didn't just see it in a little chat box. Um, and I really do hope that you continue this amazing work. Um, and I hope that, uh, it just, it just keeps on going. I had to laugh. Um, and then then I'll shut up. But when I did my first members night, at History Colorado in my new position. I'm sitting there with Todd. We're talking about archaeology randomly. And a woman walks in wanting to know where the Amachi exhibit is. And I explained to her where it was and all this. She goes, goes, well, I've been a member for many years. And my daughter-in-law is is an archaeologist. And I figured I should probably go. And I was like, sure, okay. And she goes, she was an uh, internee at a camp, and I forget which one, in California. And so she had, like, had this weird connection through Jeannie, and it was Jeannie Mobley Tanaka's. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Who then was like, you know, she was like, well, so she had this connection with the archaeology, but then also History of Colorado and Amachi. And so it was just one of those moments she, she taught it to me about her life and everything like that. And, you know, basically bonded over Amachi, which is your archaeological project. So I just thought you should hear that. And thank you for your well, presentation. Well, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, I, I wouldn't be like I wouldn't be able to do this without fantastic, you know, um, graduate students like Christian um, who did such great research and also, you know, supervised all these mountains of crews. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a great project. I just I feel so lucky to be able to do it and to work with such gracious folks. And, um, uh, you know, the, my, like, I, I don't have very many regrets. One is that it took me so long to write this book, but it's just every fit, like, I, I couldn't quite pie, tie a bow on it because every time I'd go in the field, I'd find more cool stuff, you know? It's so, like, finally, it was like, a done, Bonnie, stop it. Just write the damn thing. And it, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, um, but uh, I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, I, I went by that page very quickly. I should have left it up, but uh, uh, to acknowledge the fact that uh, most of this funding has come from um, History Colorado through the State Historical Fund. So uh, your gaming dollars at work. Um, and I, I, I very much uh, appreciate uh, all that support um, through the years because uh, doing this kind of intensive garden archeology span is not cheap. And feeding all of those people is not cheap. I spent a lot of money on gas and, and French fries. It's <laughs> <Things are> expensive. <laughs> That's great. So I wonder if we should close out Bonnie on talking about um, the, the, I guess the initiative going on with the park service to preserve yeah. Amache. Yeah. So um the, the special resource study was enabled through the, uh, the Wrangell Land Act that was passed, um, I think, last February. Um, and uh, so it's among, uh, there was a bunch of other things that are part of it, but part of that is to, to, to initiate this special resource study to, to see whether or not Amachi is suitable as an addition for the Park Service. And so it, it right now, they've extended the public comment period because unfortunately they weren't like, they were supposed to do it there. They had, luckily they got to have one public meeting, which was, was the one in Grenada, which is where, you know, the site is. Um, but the, but the Denver one had like, it just, it's, it started and COVID started. And so they had to cancel all the public meetings. So they're getting a lot less public feedback than they normally do. So they've extended the time period of comments. And I will say, uh, all due respect to the Park Service, the way that they've got it written up on the website is really silly because it makes it sound like you have to have specific knowledge of Amachi 
to write a note and you don't, you just have to say, I've, I value this history. I value places like this. And, and I, and I would like, if this were a park, I would go to it and I would encourage other people to go to it. And I would like to, it to be part of the park system. So like, you can just write that as, you know, uh, somebody who's interested in this history, or again, people who are concerned about archaeology and about how this is a really, um, imp- like it's this has it's like a time capsule of the internment experience. Um, so yeah, I would like the more people who go in and um, sign up. But I've heard from people, it's like, well, I'm not Japanese American, or I don't really know that much about the site, but I think it's important. I was like, thinking it's important is the most important thing. Just let them know. <laughs> so if individuals wanted to help out, they should submit the comments, submit yes. their comments through the link that you provided, which I will make sure the IPCAS shares. Yes, um, and yeah, Chris put put it on the Facebook, and I, I yeah, I can do that. Um, and it's uh, it's a really long URL, but I, I've got the one that gets you directly to the comments page. If you want to know mm-hmm. more about the special mm-hmm. resource study, you can back out to the other. But on the main landing page, it's really hard to find the place to uh, to put in the comments. It's, um, you know, so yeah. it goes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of typical true. park service comment collection. It, it is awful. typical park service comment collection. Yeah. Um, and we've been working as a, we've been having meetings with them to try to help make this a little bit easier, particularly for our, um, our elderly populations who we want to have, you know, their voices heard. So. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, thank you for letting me bring that up again. Um, I think especially as Coloradans, and as archaeologists, you know, uh, these are, you guys have a, have, you know, skin in this game. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Chris, for saying you'll help share it around. <laughs> <laughs> share it around Ontario. Everyone should know. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And um, uh, I look forward to uh, hearing back from people if, once they had a chance to read the book. Okay, one final question. Yes. Will you sign the book when it's safe to like, you know, <laughs> pass you the book? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. You know, I'm teaching classes in person, you know, so I'm living life on the edge. So, you know, dangerous. I would, I would meet you out for a, a beer and sign your book. Oh my God. I so want to <laughs> leave the house. I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we'll connect after. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We'll yes, thank have you shared on social media shortly thank you so much bonnie thanks Thanks, Chris. all right have a good night everyone i'm gonna go eat dinner now (laughs) it's it's time it is time (laughs) all right tell kathy hi for me okay i will thanks so much see ya bye